Welcome back to Dateline New Haven on WNHHFM. New Haven's home for community radio. I'm Paul Bass, inviting you to look behind the headlines on the stories that make community tick. This uh, segment, we've got someone who's going to be in the headlines in 2023 because he's expect he's been uh, planning to run for mayor of New Haven, and this is, a as every other year is in New Haven, a mayor election year. His name is Tom Goldenberg, and he's here with us today. Tom, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks, Paul, for having me. Just a clarification. I'm seriously considering, uh, so it's not a, I'm not mm-hmm. a candidate at this You're point. You're not an official candidate. You've been right. talking to people all over town and working on building a campaign. That's, That's a fair right. way to put it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, Tom, who are you and why would you be interested in being mayor in New Haven? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, a lot of people these days, the first thing they ask me is like, why are you running? And it's such an interesting question where, you know, I, from you know, curiosity, sometimes it comes from suspicion. Sometimes it's a uh, bewildered, like, why would you run for mayor? Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, the joke I usually start with is that I'm looking to make a lot less money and have a lot more insults. <laughs> and I couldn't think of a better way that's to do a, that's that. That's a guarantee. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Especially the insult part. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, when I think about it, um, and uh, this is the way I think about any opportunity and it's the advice I would give to anyone in school, for example, is there's these, you know, three circles of passion, demand, and skills, right? And so whatever I'm doing, it has to fit within those things. So first, let me just talk about the passion in terms of, you know, why I would be interested in doing this. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I know I recently was in one of the articles as, you know, one of the potential candidates and it, um, uh, you know, it mentioned briefly, I grew up in West Haven and had, you know, moved to New Haven a few years ago, but my connection to New Haven um, goes back pretty far. Um, you know, I, I've seen, I've been involved in the city in three different life stages. One, growing up, uh, I grew up in the Knox Street neighborhood in West Haven, which is, you know, is is more, even though West Haven is a, you know, inner suburb of New Haven, there are certainly more um, urban demographics there. And so that is certainly one of those. And, uh, you know, I just grew up being part of New Haven. I mean, it's it's funny now I'm on the uh, the board of the downtown Eden Soup Kitchen, but I remember when I was about you know nine or ten, and my dad would um, bake bread, and we'd go down to Temple Street and participate in stuff like that. You I mean, re- in terms of giving, was that the outdoor food giveaway, or what was it? This was back when it was indoors, and and he would just kind of oh Temple Street, the the Church, United Church yeah, Parish yeah. House. I mean, it's going yeah. back in like the. I guess oh, the, the early Tony 90s. Even soup kitchen. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was, it's really meaningful for me to, again, like reconnect with that and be part of the board of desk and, and help with those issues. Um, so I have a lot of memories from New Haven growing up. I went to ECA for high school in addition to... That's the Educational Center for the Arts. That's the after-school program regional where kids, uh, my kids went. It's a fantastic school. You do music. Yeah. And you told me that you studied with Warren Bird. He's the pianist <laughs> for the uh, afro Semitic Experience, which is the yeah. group that does the uh, the music that you hear at the beginning and the end of this program. What was it like learning with Warren? He seems like quite a character. I love Warren. Shout out to Warren Bird. I mean, I haven't seen him in so many years. I mean, this was... Uh, I, I was in high school when I, um, it, so we talked about Warren and David Chevin as well. So David uh, headed what they called the Creative Music Orchestra, and it was at Southern Connecticut University, and I was a high school student playing jazz piano. You played piano. Yeah, yeah. So I, I somehow I got pulled into that, and as a high school student, I was performing with David. We did uh, some private gigs as well. I, I was not prepared for that. <laughs> But, um, well, David seems to me like a taskmaster as an arranger. Like, he has an idea who's going to be playing what and how, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, as Warren seems like the free spirit. I could be wrong. Yeah. Right? A serious yeah. dude. But, oh, yeah. Warren's great. I mean, but clearly, uh, you know, I, I, I still love music. In fact, I'm going to continue. I Actually, yesterday, I, I performed some music at the East Shore Senior Center. So I, I have a, a group of people. We get together and we play Beatles songs. And you play guitar, right? I play guitar and sing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you grew up, you said that when people say like, who are you and uh, what do you have to do with New Haven? You say, I grew up in West Haven. I went to yeah. ECA. I brought bread to the day at the Honey Easy Soup Kitchen. Yeah. And then what? Then you went, you left home. And now you're so, the prodigal son, right? <laughs> yeah. In my 20s were very interesting. So I did study music in college. Uh, I went to SUNY New Paltz. And uh, I, I ended up spending most of my 20s actually in Southern India. So I was there for a period of nine years. Um, I was like in the tsunami of, uh, 2000, like literally in the water, uh, what and year then was that? 2004, uh, December 26, if I, and you were in an correctly. ashram, right? That's correct. So you yeah. were practicing Hinduism. I would say like, uh, I, I call it like my extended eat, pray, love 
phase of my life. I, you know, I, it started in college where I was studying jazz piano and there is, there's actually jazz is very improvisational. I became interested in classical, um, Indian music, which is also has a lot of, um, improvisation. In fact, a lot of jazz artists. Were, I didn't know that. So like, yeah. uh, sitar or. Well, uh, like, uh, John Coltrane's son was named Ravi after Ravi Shankar. Shankar. He was yeah. very influenced by that. So that kind of started, um, uh, my exploration there. And I became interested in things like yoga and meditation. Uh, and yeah, I, I went over there just kind of immersed in the culture there. What did you do? Were you helping yeah. run an ashram? Like what was so your job? So this, this place was more focused on, uh, service and humanitarian things. I mean, there certainly was elements of, you know, the things I meant like yoga, meditation, et cetera, but, um, a lot of, uh, hospitals, uh, schools. And then once the tsunami happened, which was right in like literally right there, um, there was a massive coordination to, uh, provide relief efforts. Um, and so that was kind of the first phase of my period in India through that. I learned the, some of the local languages, including Malayalam, which probably nobody listening to this has heard I've of. never heard of it. Yeah. It's, it's a fun fact about it. It's a palindrome. So it's spelled the same way forwards as it is backwards. What, how you spell it? Malayalam, M-A-L-A-Y-A-L-A-M. Oh, okay. Um, so fun fact. Um, but yeah, I, I, I learned some of the languages and then later on I, I, um, I studied Sanskrit and actually, um, I studied for a number of years and, uh, the last few years that I was in India, I taught Sanskrit at a university to mm -hmm. mostly students, you know, international students. Um, so that was, you know, my break from, uh, you know, not just New Haven, right. But the United States. And then I come back my early thirties, I come back to New Haven. I'm then living in, uh, Westville. And at this point I, I was, well, what year are we talking about? Oh uh, goodness, ten years ago. So So ten years ago you moved back to Westville. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, that's right. I was on Harrison Street. Harrison, and, oh, okay. You're and, right by Becky. Okay. So yeah. Mike Kim writes in no one. I don't really understand the question, Mike. I'm sorry, but thanks for listening. You're listening to Tom Goldenberg, who's been working on a campaign for mayor, that's the way to put it, right? Um and, and we're talking about Dateline New Haven, W N H H F M New Haven's home for community radio. So you come back in your thirties and I'm sorry, this is ten years ago. Yeah, and so I Professionally, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. So I, I ended up working in hospitality downtown. So this is like the second what phase. What does that mean? Uh, so I was a server at Tali for, for a while. And then I was a bartender at Pacifico. Wow. Uh, and then Earloom. And I did a brief stint at ID Brazil as well. I don't know if you're familiar with the Brazilian oh, restaurant in West Haven. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so that, what, what, are you a good bartender? Like what you learn how to, what's your best drink? Uh, at Pacifico, we made a lot of mojitos at ID Brazil um, I have several bruises to my thumb from cutting limes for the, uh, caipirinhas, which is mm -hmm. the Brazilian. What's drink. your favorite drink to make? Like if someone comes to your house? Uh, so I actually, I, I don't really, it's funny, right? Like I was a bartender. I don't drink now. Um, but I'll usually get some type of, you know, virgin mojito or something like that. So you're trying to find your way there. You were, yeah. you went to the Sanskrit, uh, the sitar thing in it, ashram in India, you come back to New Haven, you're working at restaurants and yeah. How do you go from there to McKinsey? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because it's it's funny, right? Like um, I've I've been at McKinsey for the last three and a half years, and the typical pathway is like someone goes to a very elite um, university or something. It's just not my story at all. Um, but what happened is I in this period I met my now wife. Mm -hmm. um, she was studying. What's at her name? Jessica, Doctor Jessica Holzer. She's now mm -hmm. program director at University of New Haven. Hi, sweetie. Um, <laughs> So uh, I met her, and then she got her first tenure track position in New York. Hofstra, so, right? That's correct. Yeah. So my we moved to New there. York. Um, that was, you know, so again, exiting the second phase of my life in New Haven. Mm -hmm. And in New York, I, you know, um, just a lot changed, right? So I, I ended up um, going to one of these non-accredited coding boot camps, um, learned mm -hmm. how to code, and. Within a year, I went from making about thirty thousand as a you know bartender to making instantly like eighty thousand, ninety thousand the next year. Um, so that was a big eye opener. Doing what coding? As a software engineer, yeah. I joined an early stage startup. I was like the third or fourth employee, which was really good because I got to see the different roles in a company. You know, between marketing. What and, company was it? Uh, Agolo. So they've. How since, you spell that? Yeah, A G O L O. And, uh, I joined, you know, right when they were just getting and started to get attention from like 
Google and, um, and Microsoft became an investor and now they've expanded, but being part of that growth trajectory gave me, you know, the opportunity to learn a lot in a really short period of time. Um, but I knew <laughs> even back then I had an itch to be an entrepreneur. And so after about two years, I left the company. This was when, um, my wife was uh, pregnant at the time. So it was kind of a, a big risk. Um, but I, I took the jump and became a full-time entrepreneur. I co-founded a startup. I was the chief technology officer at the time. Um, but really, I mean, when you do a startup, again, you kind of get to do everything. You know, the business strategy, the product um, design, development, et cetera. So I did that for a year and a half. What and company was that? The name was Commandive. I didn't give it that name. Most C -O -A people. Yeah. You know, co Command I V E. No E at the end. Yeah. Okay. I, what did it do? Like was it? Yeah. A, was it was a, It was like um, a wealth management platform. It's a more of a jargon way, but basically like how you invest your money with Robinhood, um, the same way we would do, but we'd also provide a layer of investment advice. Mm -hmm. So um, you know we would you know ask a series of questions about what are your investment goals and then we'd recommend oh these um you know exchange traded funds might be most appropriate for you gotcha so so you did that and then did you came to new haven after that or did the company yeah, make it no the company did not make it so uh i still like, have to like work most for startups like, yeah. yeah oh then yeah. you ended up at, at mckinsey yeah so when that startup um was in its final stages and we were closing things down I did have, I had a friend who worked for a consulting company called Boston Consulting Group. Um, I, I had never heard of them. And, uh, you know, somehow it ended up that I ended up going there. I, I liked the interview process and went there more in a technology focused role. But um, w what I learned is that, you know, BCG, I'll call for short, sure, like they do a lot of strategy consulting. They do um, public sector work as well. And I just became fascinated with this other side of the company, the ability to really weigh in on very important strategic matters, both for private businesses, startups, and, um, you know, state and local government. So I, I spent a year there. I did some very interesting work, um, but I, I really had that desire to transition into more some of these strategic public sector opportunities. And so that's why I made the, the move over to McKinsey. The other thing that happened around this time was that, uh, you know, I, I now had a, a, a newborn daughter, and, um, you know, we found ourselves coming to New Haven every weekend anyways, just to spend time with my family. Um, and, you know, my wife, one day we're at dinner. Is this during the pandemic or before? This is well before, yeah. It's like four and a half, five years ago we had mm -hmm. this discussion. My wife said, hey, you're a consultant. You don't, you're not tied to a specific office. You kind of go wherever your clients are. So let's move back to New Haven. And uh, I was thrilled that she said that. And it was a big a gamble, you know, because her position was at Hofstra University and, you know, the commute from New Haven to Long Island is, is horrendous. Um, and she did that for a good six to nine months, I believe, until she was able to So you came back four years ago? That's uh, four and a half years, yeah. And you bought a house next door to Justin Elliker. Correct. I'm not next door. Oh, we're well, our, yeah. our kids go to the same uh, daycare though. So which one is that, Lila Day? That's correct. Yeah. But I thought you, you're not on his block or anything like that. Uh, he's on Orange. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm on Nickel. Oh, okay. So I'm across okay. from the tennis courts. Okay. Yeah. So you came back to New Haven, and we're talking to Tom Goldenberg, who's been in New Haven, and he's now seriously considering running for mayor of New Haven, yeah. and he's here on Dateline New Haven. So how'd you get from there to wanting to run for yeah. mayor of New Haven? So, why Why do you yeah. want to be the mayor? Yeah, so let me go, remember I said this, uh, uh, you know, consultants, we always have these frameworks, right? Yeah. So uh, passion, demand, skills, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, my passion is, I, you know, I love this city. This city is part of who I am. I'm, I'm here, right? Um, I also see incredible potential in the city, um, not just from a traditional, you know, we, of course we can grow economically, but the opportunity to have um, inclusive growth. I think there's a tremendous opportunity there. Now, in terms of the demand, um, I will come out and just flat say it. I, I think that New Haven currently faces a crisis of leadership. And what do I mean by that? If we look at education, we see that last year we had the worst chronic absenteeism in the state of Connecticut. Uh, almost six out of 10 students were chronically absent. Eight out of 10 
third graders in our system are below um, grade level for reading. And, you know, the current development that is, it's, it's so bad that the State Department of Education is hosting public meetings with the district now. So I, I think what I would, um, if I do decide to run, what I would want to have is um, an administration that truly cares about and is hands-on with public education. And, you know, what do I mean by that? I mean, you know, showing teachers the respect that they deserve, engaging with families and students, and ensuring that there is rigor, that there is accountability and transparency in the district leadership. Um, you know, it's not just education. Um, I think there's, you know, I, I, I believe I overheard some of the previous conversation about affordable housing. There's, uh, you know, I, I'm seeing or we're seeing a, a, a large increase in the real value of taxes, even though that the mill rate has gone down, the actual value of taxes. And this is in neighborhoods like Newhallville, Dixwell, Fairhaven, where um, the real value of taxes is up 20% or more. This is going to push people out of home ownership. It's going to how would you how rents. would you how would you prevent that? Well, I I I will in pieces. I'll I'll, I'll provi- you know provide a, a full robust plan, and that involves a lot of input from stakeholders in the community as well as outside experts. But I I would say as a first step, we need to work with the state legislature to um, create some ability to stabilize the rents. Meaning that, fund. No, so um, so in other cities, what they'll have is, unless you make meaningful improvements to the property, um, there's a certain percentage above which you sh- you cannot just ad hoc raise the rent. Um, you know, rent. Okay, cap rent. Correct. Rent. Yeah, yeah. Right, so exactly. you talking about you talking about rent control? It, so rent control is a little bit different. The the term for it is rent stabilization. They're working on this in the state legislature. Right, we um, need enabling legislation. You need enabling legislation. That's correct. So, and, and what do you think about charters? Back to education. Would you like to see more charters? I got the sense looking at your stuff that you're a charter guy. Really? What gave you that? Impression? I'm trying to remember what it was, but you've been working on charter schools. What do you think uh, about charter schools? Yeah, I I think it's it's interesting, right? I mean, this is a very divisive and controversial topic. I think um, there I, I I can see elements in on on both sides here in terms of you know, charters play by slightly different rules. And I think the intention is to kind of create a, a, a means to do experimentation. That was the original intention of charters, but they're not a replacement for traditional public schools. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're certainly not an apples to apples comparison in terms of what rules are played by. What school, what, what do you, what's your favorite school? What school works the best and what school has the biggest challenge in New Haven? Like what schools have you visited and seen working well or not working well. So uh, my my neighbor is uh, Matt Brown, who was recently, yeah. um, you know, Wilbur announced Cross. at Wilbur Cross. And um, well, I haven't been, I know several of the teachers and the staff at HSC, but I can say that that, that story is just incredible. And um, I, I feel very inspired by what he was able to do. And I'm really hopeful that, um, you know, HSC is a, you know, Cross is a different beast than HSC, right? But I am hopeful that he's able to bring some meaningful change there. Yeah. What would you like to see done differently? Like, tell me about a school you've been to where you saw X happening and you would like Y to happen. Um, oh, man. I, I mean, it's, there's, there's just so many things. I think the, the big thing for me, let me start with the leadership. I, I, we need rigor, right? Um, when we face challenges, uh, that's natural. That's going to happen in anyone's administration and in anyone's leadership. But it's how we confront them. It's how we face up to what's happening and, and be honest and not, um, you know, do a lot of hand waving and, and saying that these are things out of our control. Mm-hmm. There are always going to be things outside of our control. And of course, we're going to acknowledge them. But the discussion and the effort should be on what are the controllable factors. So in absenteeism, I, I gave public testimony on this, but. Um, we need to do, you know, what are the things that are factors in schools? That, so what did you come up with? What would you do different in absenteeism? Well, we don't, I haven't seen, I, what I asked for is, you know, what is the, the status? How do students feel about things like bullying? How engaged are they in the classroom? You know, there are other districts that they... So you would poll, you would do more communication, polling and talking to students about why they're not coming? At a very first step. Um, mm-hmm. That's not a solution, but we're not even there. Um, mm-hmm. And so a lot of the discussion is, 
you know, absenteeism is based on so many economic and family problems. But, um, I, you know, I, it, it reminds me of a conversation I had with, um, so Jim Liebman, I studied with him. He's, uh, he was the chief accountability officer in New York city public schools. And I, I had said to him, um, Jim, you know, this, the data shows that, you know, 25% of, um, education outcome is due just to, uh, inequality in economics. And he said, that's fine. I care about the other 75%. And I, I think that's the attitude that we so need factors to bring. that are within our control. You know, a lot of people have asked you, I think, why are you running for mayor if you haven't been involved in politics before in yeah. New Haven? You have you, you have connections to New Haven, but you haven't been here, you know, like for decades, decades. Mm -hmm. Why are you running for mayor and not older? Yeah. So I, I mean, we've we've talked about this uh, before, but uh, because the work I do, the work I do as a consultant has been for cities and state governments, mm -hmm. and as such, um, I I just would not be able to do any elected office or even an appointed office. Um, it's just a, a company policy. And so, you know, I've, I have made the decision to wind down my time, um, at my company and, um, you know, am considering this as an option. But I mean, why would you run for this job rather than get yeah. started at all? Or what makes you think you should, like a lot of people say like, yeah, who are yeah. you? I should be the mayor. If, <laughs> yeah. if it's the first thing you run for. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I do have a lot of experience working on relevant topics in my current work. I mean, I've, I've worked with K-12 systems. I've worked mm -hmm. on holistic workforce development programs, economic strategy, inclusive economic growth, uh, sanitation even. But, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'd say um, I, I like what I've been doing. It's exciting. It's meaningful. It's impactful. Um, you know, for me to give up my job that is supporting my family uh, I need to be able to at least replace it with a, uh, you know, a, a salary, and that's just uh, not how. So it's a salary, you wish I'd run for that. You know, the three thousand right. year for all. This. It's 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 uh, you know I wouldn't say it's just the salary. It's also the level of impact. I mean, I am mm -hmm. attracted to, um, you know, as as a mayor, I think you can do some very exciting things. That if I was in a particular department of the city. Um, you know, I flirted with the idea of uh, being a comptroller or something like that, but mm -hmm. you you just have more breadth to create meaningful change. And a lot of these problems are so interconnected as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. Do you have a um a an a role model for politician or government yeah. official? Who's your hero? Yeah, I mean, I have two two heroes. I mean, Michael Nutter. Shout out to Michael Nutter. Um, he's someone that I've 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 studied mayor with. Mayor of Philadelphia. Yeah, former mayor of Philadelphia. I I. I mean, he's just an inspiring person. And what about him? What makes him the person? You I mean, his tenure in Philly, Philly is just such a, um, I mean, look right now that the current mayor has, what did he publicly said that he doesn't want to be mayor or something like that? It's, it's a tough, tough city. And, um, his tenure, uh, you know, he got a lot done. He did a lot of economic growth. Crime went down under his tenure. Mm -hmm. um, and just my personal interactions with... Um, what was your relationship? Him. How we, how'd you interact with him? What was your I, I studied one-on-one uh, -on -one with him. We, we actually spent a good amount of time looking at New Haven and seeing what are some of the lessons from Philly and his... But how did you get there. hooked up with him? He's at the Columbia, um, the SEPA school, the, the School of Public Affairs. And I, 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 while I was working, this is crazy, right? Because I have a family and I ha work at uh, McKinsey, but I also somehow found time to get an executive MBA in the last few years. So that was how I got connected to Michael Nutter at Columbia. Well, it's been great to, to meet you on publicly on air, Tom. I've met you before. Do you have any final things you want to say uh, to New Haven about your possible mayoral run and what you want people to know about you. I, I just want to hear from people. I mean, I, I say, you know, I don't care who anyone supports. Um, I want to hear from everyone. I want to sit down with everyone and hear what people have to say and have a good discussion. Um, so that's where I'm at right now. All right. Well, Tom yeah. Feldman, thanks for joining us on, on uh, Dateline. Everyone. Thank you, Harry Dross, for the, the work producing today's show and all year. And thanks for listening to us this year. I'm looking forward to 2023. Until then... We're going to take it out with the Afro-Semitic experience performing I Wish I Knew How It Feel to Be Free from the group CD, A Plea for Peace. This is Paul Bass inviting you to fly with a, free with us all day, all night, all weekend, and all year long on WNHH, New Haven's home for community radio. Mm -hmm.